today in Dave's Garage. We're going to build this animated LED Christmas decoration as we learn how to use and control individually addressable LEDs. We'll cover every step from what to buy to how to install, modify, and control them. I'll show you how to set the controller up, but from there you simply plug it into a USB power brick, sit back, and listen to your wife tell you how beautiful it is. All right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. In our last episode, which you've already perhaps seen if you're a subscriber, we covered the history of LEDs and introduced the individually addressable LED. In case you missed it, those are what we'll be using to provide the light show within the boxes. Long story short, we can control the color and brightness of every LED on an individual basis. That will allow us to do color fades, blends, palettes, sparkles, and more. We'll start with a simple off-the-shelf plug-in controller that works right out of the box, and then we'll try a software package called Night Driver that comes with far better effects built in, and that will allow us to create and program our own effects as well. I'll build it two different ways, so you can pick your favorite, and either way, we'll be assembling everything from off-the-shelf hardware and open-source software. You can get it working as is, and then you can modify and personalize it as much or as little as you'd like. It's a great way to learn the basics. Now, the first thing we need, unless you're super crafty and can make them yourself out of chicken wire and fireproof angel feathers, are a set of translucent decorative LED boxes. Fortunately, Amazon has what appears to be literally dozens, if not hundreds, of choices. To save you some time, I'll put links in the video description to all the parts that I used so you at least know that they work together. Now, the ones I'm using came with some basic white illumination, and that way, I know the material should be tolerant of whatever heat LEDs happen to make. Once we've selected a set of boxes, we need to choose the LEDs we plan to add to them. I'm going to show you two different approaches. In the first case, I've added a 32 LED ring to the base of each box, and they're chained together into a string of 96 sequential LEDs. I next used strands of single LEDs like these that are also available on Amazon. And if you want to be really fancy, you could even do both. Our next step is to install the LEDs into the boxes. In my ring case, I am simply going to set the three rings on a flat surface facing upwards and then lower the boxes over top of them. <laughs> it's that simple if you want it to be. Or you can be as elaborate as you like just as long as your LEDs are installed as one long sequence. Make sure that you keep track of the number of LEDs in each box so that we can configure the software later. For the strand case, I'll stuff the single LEDs in such a way as to appear haphazard and random, but with about one third of the 50 LEDs in each of the boxes so that they're distributed somewhat evenly. I've used zip ties to hold the strand up to the top side so they don't all settle to the bottom. With the LEDs installed, we need something to control them because individually addressable LEDs don't do anything if you don't have a controller telling them what to do. They don't even turn on at all. As I alluded to up front, there are at least two ways that we can control the LED color show inside the boxes. The first way is to purchase a cheap dongle with some built-in effects, set up, and forget it. That's the easiest way to get started, and it's all well and good, but we'll also go one major step further by using our own microcontroller and programming an effect using an open source piece of software known as Night Driver. Before we can run, however, we should learn to walk, and that means I'll start with the pre-made controller. I grabbed this one off Amazon, and there are several to choose from. Just make sure you get one that supports 5 volts and that is intended to be used with individually addressable LEDs, which you can generally determine by looking at the connector. If it's the same three-wire plastic connector, it's probably the right type, but read the description to be sure. What you're looking for is WS2812B control. To use the dongle, we just plug the connector into our LED strand or rings and then plug a 5-volt power adapter into the dongle itself. It should immediately start producing some kind of garish effect. To change or control that effect, we need to install an app on the phone. Let's scan the QR code right off the dongle, which should take us to the App Store. You can see I already have it installed, so I'll just pick Open. Once I'm on the main screen of the LED Controllers app, I click the plus sign to add a device. This is where the whole Internet of Things breaks down in my eyes, because you must now give this thing your Wi-Fi credentials if you want to do much with it. Now, fortunately, this one appears to work without creating an online cloud account of any kind, at least, though it tries to get you to create one. To make the connection, we go to our Wi-Fi settings and we join the phone to the little Wi-Fi hotspot that the LED dongle has created. It will be a random one named with something like LED and then a bunch of numbers. Once we have joined the dongle's Wi-Fi, we return to the phone app and let it do some negotiation. We can select which real Wi-Fi we want the dongle to use and then give it the proper credentials. Now, I'm not going to give some offshore LED vendor my real Wi-Fi credentials. I mean, why make it easy for them? You can make it not so easy. That's right. 
you can. And so I did by creating a special VLAN and SSID for all of my IoT devices in the home so they can't see my personal Wi-Fi. Now that's a whole episode on its own, but it's something you should look into. I also got stuck at this point because it kept saying that it had failed and I kept just retrying things. Once I finally gave up and cancelled out though, I was surprised to discover that the device had successfully been added and that the error messages were just some kind of erroneous bug of some kind. But what do you want for 12 bucks? And that's just one reason why we're going to make our own very shortly. In any event, you should now be able to use the phone app to change the LED colors, control them, select effects from the built-in list, and so on. The app even has the ability to create some limited sequencing and some new effects and tweak existing ones, so with some tinkering, you should be able to find a pleasing combination of some kind. Now you could stop there, but what fun would that be? I'm going to give you a taste of Night Driver by quickly setting up my own microcontroller from scratch, downloading the Night Driver software from GitHub, building it, and flashing it onto the chip. Next, I'm going to use the Night Driver server package to write a Christmas effect in C-sharp, and then broadcast that effect's color show over the Wi-Fi network to the ESP32, which will in turn display it live on the LEDs. Overkill? Perhaps. So I'm going to blaze through the steps pretty quickly so you get a look at the big picture. And then if there's sufficient interest in setting up and using Night Driver, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and to let me know in the comments that you'd like to see a more detailed episode on fully deploying Night Driver, and I'd be happy to do one. To run Night Driver, the next thing we need is a microcontroller to run the LED effects. Now, I've selected this ESP32 module from Adafruit, known as the TFT Feather S3. And the last thing we need is a power brick for the USB output to power it. Whatever you wind up doing for LEDs, you should make sure that you're not exceeding the power supply's ability to provide power or the module's ability to regulate and distribute it. The last thing you want to do is create a hazard, so check your data sheets to be certain. The first step is going to be soldering the LED connector to the ESP32 module. Now, this loose connector is almost always included with the LED strip or rings or strands that you've purchased. The strip itself will have a male connector, and this female connector then gets soldered to the module. You could hardwire it if you don't have a connector for some reason, but if you have it, keep using it because it allows your module to stay plug and play. The connections are simple, and there are only three of them. The connections are also clearly labeled on the module itself. First, we connect the ground pin to the module to the ground wire. The ground wire will either be black or white. It is not, and never is, the green wire in this case. Green is the data wire, and we connect it next. You can change what pin to use, but the software that we're going to use assumes pin 5 by default, so we'll just connect the green wire to pin 5. Finally, we need to connect the red power wire, and we connect it to the 5 volt output on the module, which in my case is labeled USB. That means that the module will pass its 5 volts from the USB right onto the LED strip and power the LEDs. It's a handy shortcut, but as I said, you have to be careful not to draw too much power. Note that this only works because we're using a 5 volt strip, and this is a 5 volt USB pin. If you had like a 12 volt strip that you were powering externally somehow, you would definitely not want to connect the 12 volt strip to the 5 volt module. In that case, you would just have ground and data and no power connection between the two. Now, if for some reason you didn't want to connect the boxes to each other in one long strand, the software that we're going to be using, Night Driver, also supports wiring each box with its own strand connected to a separate pin on its own data wire, but that's a complication that we'll have to wait for another day and another episode. If we were to power it up at this point, absolutely nothing would happen. That's because we haven't loaded any software onto the chip yet, so it's not doing anything with those LEDs. Flashing the microcontroller with code consists of three parts. We need Microsoft Visual Studio Code with the Platform I.O. extension to do it. We also need Git so that we can get the code from GitHub. I'll proceed as though we have VS Code with Platform I.O. and Git already installed, so I can show you the steps that are specific to this project. To get started, we bring up Visual Studio Code and we pick Clone Git Repository from the very start page. That will copy down the code that we actually need. All we have to do is specify a location for it on our local hard drive and the rest should be automatic. If all goes well, when it's done cloning the code, you'll be asked if you want to open the project. You should go ahead and say yes. Next, I need to create a file called secrets.h that contains my Wi-Fi credentials and it will bake them in. To do so, I'm just going to make a copy of the example file included and edit the specifics. I check to make sure that the configuration selected in platformio.ini is appropriate for the Feather chip that I'm running, and then I can simply press F1 and select platformio build from the menu. When that's complete, I make sure the chip is plugged into the computer, and then I just select Upload. As long as there's only one ESP32 module plugged into your computer at any one time, Platform.io will generally figure out the right port for you automatically. 
It only takes about 20 seconds to upload the firmware to the chip, at which point it will reboot. When it first starts up, not a lot happens. It lights every 10th LED to show me that it's indeed running, but that's about it. That's because Night Driver can do both built-in effects as well as receive effects over Wi-Fi, and I've opted for just the latter. That means we can write our effect on the computer side using almost any language of our choice, and the Night Driver server will pump the results over Wi-Fi to be shown on the Night Driver strip code running on the ESP32 and send it on to your LEDs. The way it works, at least in general, is that content is generated for the LEDs on the server side, but it's done a few seconds in advance and then sent over Wi-Fi to the chips, which in turn buffer and hold that data until a timestamp on it comes due, at which point it then displays it. The server and the chip both use the NTP protocol to keep their clocks in perfect sync, and so you could even build a jumbotron out of smaller matrices and they'd all display in perfect sync. I'd build one to show you, but the panels are expensive and I can't find anybody willing to donate a bunch of color-matched Hub75 panels for a demo like that. But perhaps one day I'll find a video wall abandoned on Facebook Marketplace. You never know. Back to reality. Let's jump into C Sharp for a moment, since the server is a .NET Core app that can run on Windows, Mac, or Linux equally well. By the way, that's also true of VS Code and Platform I.O. I try to keep all my code fairly cross-platform these days for maximum flexibility. In fact, when I run this setup, I'll be doing it on a Mac while the server code runs remotely in a Linux VM under Proxmox and talks to an ESP32 LED strip controller running free RTOS code that I originally wrote under Windows. It doesn't have to be like that, it just can be. The custom effect I want to create will be a smooth palette blend that will fill each box with a different rotating color and that sparkles every 10 seconds. To do it, I'll create a new LED effect class and call it the Presence Effect. I'll have an inner effect, which is the smooth palette effect, so it can do all the real drawing work for me. But all you have to do for any new effect is to implement the render method. I'll first call that inner effects draw frame so it can draw my background, which will be the palette sweep. And then, every 10 seconds, when it modulus is with zero, I'll draw some random white pixels over top that palette. I'll use a sign function to sort of ramp the sparkles in and out over the course of that second, and that's about all there is to it. Now, the Night Driver server I'm using already serves all the LED functions here in my shop and outside, so it already serves about 15 different locations. Even the windows and the LED knickknacks behind me are running a VM off in the closet on the Storinator. To add the presence class, I'll add a new Christmas presence class to the list of locations and tell it how many frames per second it should draw at. Next, I can define the location, which basically just knows how to keep track of its own LEDs and what effects are running on them at what scheduled time. With that complete, I'll run the server app and it will spin up and run all 16 LED features. My presence will be the first one in the top left. Here we can see the IP address of the controller, what the Wi-Fi signal is like, the socket status, the clock status, the buffer depth, even how much power the LEDs are using on that strip, and so on. As a final experiment, I decided to try the cubes with both the rings and the strands. To make that work, all I needed to do was to plug the strands into the end of the rings and then update the total number of LEDs in the strand code. Night Driver can send updates to the LEDs at more than 60 frames per second if needed, so it's limited really by the number of LEDs that you have in the chain, in the sense that if you have about a thousand LEDs, it drops to 30 frames per second as the best you can do. That's not a concern for this shorter set, of course, just something to keep in mind for long sets. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss the follow-up episodes on the Night Driver LED software. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here. Dave's Garage.